Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stokowiak. This is episode 146. Today, Jared and I are talking to Sarah May about mining the gap and why we're missing our best chances for gender parity, a much-needed conversation on this show. Great having Sarah on the show today. She's the founder of Rails Bridge, director of Ruby Central, and she's a chief consultant at DevMind. we got some awesome sponsors for the show, CodeShip, TopTile, and Code School. We'll tell you a bit more about Top Town Code School later in the show, but our friends at CodeShip, they want you to deploy to production 10 times faster than you're doing today. They do it by this awesome new feature called Parallel CI. And if you want faster tests, you have to run your builds in parallel. And with Parallel CI, you can now split up your test commands in up to 10 test pipelines. This lets you run your test suite faster than ever before in parallel and drastically reduce the time it takes to run your builds and get that code to production. They integrate with GitHub and Bitbucket. You can deploy to cloud services like Heroku, AWS, and many more. And you can get started today for free by trying out their free plan, which includes 100 builds a month and five private projects. Or you can use our offer code, the Changelog Podcast. Again, that code is the Changelog Podcast to get a 20% discount on any plan you choose for three months. Head to codeship.com slash the Changelog to get started. And now on to the show. Everyone back uh, back here with Sarah May. Sarah, how are you? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we got Jared on the line, too. You can't forget Jared, right? Jared, how are you? I'm hanging in there. How are you? Hanging in there. Well, you know, that's the best way to be, to be hanging in there. This is the first show in a long time. This show's being live broadcast. So if you're a member, you may be listening to this live. We didn't do a lot of promotion around it because Sarah wanted to be the experimental guest to be on the live broadcast. We're live broadcasting just to members. So if you want to listen to the show live, you've got to be a member. That's the that's the barrier to entry for that. So you can do that by going to thechangelaw.com slash membership. You learn all the details there. You get access to Slack, the live channel, and a ton of other stuff to sort of surround our community of open source enthusiasts. And uh, Sarah, it's so great to have you on the show today. We got suggested to have you on the show um, by Matt Brixton, actually um, a member it's just having a conversation around your article, which is, I guess, somewhat popular. What do you think? Mind the Gap? Was it popular? It was pretty popular. It's yeah. definitely Not quite as popular as your other article you mentioned That's in right. the pre-call, but yeah, still popular. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been interesting. It hasn't made the front page of, you know, the programming subreddit, but, uh, but it's definitely sparked some really interesting conversations, especially on Twitter. Yeah. So let's give an introduction to you, Sarah. I mean, um, I knew of you, you know, Jared, in the pre-call, we talked about us being Rubius at heart. So we've known of you for a while. But for those who may not know who Sarah May is, who are you? Who am I? That's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I am right now. I'm in the chief consultant at DevMind Software, which means that I'm working uh, with clients, mostly in San Francisco. DevMind's based in Chicago, but I am I am the San Francisco office. Uh, and I'm also a director of Ruby Central, which is a nonprofit that runs both RubyConf and RailsConf, which are the two largest Ruby-related conferences in the world. And uh, I am also the co-founder of RailsBridge, which is an organization working to get more diversity into the Ruby and Rails communities. And uh, let's see, what else do I do? <laughs> That's about it. I do a lot of conference speaking. I do a reasonable amount of writing, and I'm working on a book. And you also do the refactoring of the codes. I do a lot of that. Yeah. Most of what I do in my client work is going into, uh, I wouldn't say elderly code bases exactly, but going into uh, mature code bases and helping the team figure out where and when to refactor things. Elderly. I like that. It has a certain connotation to it, doesn't it? <laughs> I feel like a Rails app can actually be elderly after like three months. So, <laughs> No doubt. Just depends. Elderly. You know, it's it's funny too because we just had David Hunter hands on this on this call before last week, um, and you're the director of Ruby Central, so you've got uh, RailsConf coming up here in May. Uh, some exciting stuff happened around that call of proposals. I think is closed now, right? Yeah, we've announced the program. I'm really excited. Uh, we have a very strong program this year, and I'm super excited. Of course, that David's going to come back and do his keynote as he always does. Yes, of course you can't can't have a RailsConf without DHH giving the keynote, right? I know, right? What would we do? It's like Apple with no Steve Jobs. Yeah, and Super that sad. hasn't worn out for them, has it? <laughs> no, no, I guess not. It has not. So on uh, on RailsBridge um, and DevMind, of course, as well, uh, the work you do there, what's what's cool about RailsBridge? You, you had some recent news, too, about Bridge Foundry, so a slight shift in the way 
the organization is sort of organized, I think, from a nonprofit standpoint. Can you talk a little bit about RailsBridge and what you do there? Yeah, absolutely. So RailsBridge, we, when we, I started it with a, a woman named Sarah Allen in 2009. And originally it was, uh, it was, a, it was our goal was to bring more women into the Ruby community in San Francisco so that I could go to a Ruby meetup and not be the only one there. That was essentially my goal. Uh, it turned into something much larger than that. And we've done hundreds of workshops now across uh, dozens of different countries. And we've had, I think, the last count, about 10,000 people go through one of our workshops, which is awesome. Uh, we've expanded our mission a bit, and we're now focusing on bringing in members of other rep- underrepresented groups as well. We've done, uh, we did a, we did a uh, workshop with the Black Founders. We have a couple of, uh, we have the curriculum translated into Spanish. We've done a couple of Spanish language workshops. Uh, and recently, we decided that the model that we've been using is actually super useful for other technical communities as well. So we formed a parent organization called Bridge Foundry. And under that, we now have Closure Bridge, which is pretty cool. Yeah. They've been holding uh, events. We have Mobile Bridge, which does both iOS and Android uh, workshops. And then, of course, we've still got Rails Bridge under there as well. So we're we're excited to bring that model to other communities. We have a little bit of Rails Bridge here in the heart of the change law because uh, Beverly Nelson, I think it's your south, she's your southeastern chapter manager. Is that what you call? Yes, uh, what absolutely. Beverly does? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Beverly's been on the team for a while. Worked with her at Pure Charity. She uh, loves learning, as you know. So yeah. one of the things that she's tasked with here on the change log, not so much on the podcast, but uh, on our editorial side is really um, like she just put out a post this last week called a huge list of Cohen's because everybody loves Ruby Cohen's to learn Cohen to, to learn Ruby, the enlightened way, of course. And so there's, you know, this splurge of other, um, of other languages using the Cohen's um, Cohen's way of, of doing things. So she's on the team and we're happy to have her. So that's, that's cool. There's some, some crossover there. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that. You didn't know that, huh? See, every day we got surprises for you. Every day. <laughs> In fact, she's working up a post right now about Bridge Troll. Oh, oh, nice. Which I believe is your guys' is, is a software. Is it a it Rails is. app? It's, or? A, it's an open source Rails app that we've built to manage the workshop process that we have. So it takes our SVPs. And originally we did most of it through meetup.com. Uh-huh. Um, but as we got bigger, we discovered, of course, that meetup has some limitations being a service and uh, being not within everyone's price range, certainly. So uh, we decided to build this, and we also think it's a great way to for our students, if they're interested in getting involved in open source, for them to uh, sort of nice, easy entry into into the field because it's software they've already used, and mm-hmm. it's people they already know, and it's uh, so we it sort of serves dual purpose in that sense. I like the name Bridge Troll. Definitely a cool name. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. Any other fun internal names y'all use that uh, you could share here today? Fun internal names. Hmm. I'm not sure. Hmm. Bridge Troll came out about actually because uh, mostly because we had uh, we had a workshop I think once where we have we usually have childcare at our workshops, and uh, at that workshop the childcare was in a conference room and the kids drew all over the um, all over the whiteboards, which of course is fine. But one of them drew a troll, and someone came in and said, nice. "Hey, <laughs> that looks like." So that that's was cool. cool. That's that's cool. That's a nice story too. That uh, it's it's funny those happy accidents sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah. Where things happen like that. So let's um, let's dive deep into the heart of the conversation. So our show is roughly you know forty five minutes, forty uh, fifty five minutes ish. Um, and today, like I mentioned, Matt Brixton, one of our members, has suggested. Um, and I've read the blog post before that. I didn't think about having you on the show to, to sort of talk about this, but. Uh, we serve our member community, so they want to hear it. We're going to have you on the show to talk about mining the gap, and I certainly enjoyed the you know the perspective that you brought to the table here in this in this conversation. It's really kind of going around why we're missing our best chance for gender parity. Can you talk a bit about like the overall summary of of what this article is about, and we'll sort of dive into some specific points uh, along the way. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Uh- I read this mainly because I see a really interesting trend happening in the Ruby community and also in other communities right now, which is that we have a bunch of people who are coming in because of uh, various code schools and boot camps and things like that. 
we have never had an influx of this type before. And in fact, I think the Ruby community is about the first, we're the, we're the vanguard in that we are the first community to be seeing this because a lot of the early code schools taught Ruby and taught Rails. And so now uh, we have this enormous pool of people that uh, are junior developers and are in general much more diverse than the community we have right now. And so we've got this amazing opportunity to really bring a lot of diversity into our uh, into our community. But in order to do that, we need to know what our own limitations are and we need to understand how it is that we got where we are and how we can not make the same mistakes when we're trying to hire people now. Uh, and, and the other thing that prompted this was that I found, uh, I, I love reading scientific research of various types that relate to things like uh, programming teams and practices and, and how we write software. And I came across one uh, that was a very basic, it was a, actually an economics study about the way that women and men are perceived when they're being uh, interviewed or they're being, or when you're looking at a resume or when you're uh, evaluating a conference proposal, things like that. And what they found was that people who are from Western cultures have a very strong built-in uh, bias that they will look at a resume that has that is exactly the same, except one of them has a female name at the top and one of them has a male name at the top, and they will evaluate the one with the male name at the top more strongly than they will the one with the female name at the top. And uh, it's unintentional, right? This is something we all do because it's part of the culture that we live in. And uh, and so the question is, like, what can we do to to move away from that? What can we do to to combat that bias? Because if we just allow it to continue the way it's been going, what's going to happen is you're going to look at, you're going to try and bring these people in, but you're not going to be able, you, you, it's much harder to get them into your interview pipeline, get them in to your company, if you're not aware of this bias that everyone has. This bias, you say, has kind of exposed itself in, in what you might call an epic way in our specific community, uh, the open source and startup community. Uh, which is kind of a, a, a microcosm of the larger tech industry, which already has the problem. Uh, some of the stats that you gave out there is that in the industry overall, women make up 26% of developers, which is already pretty bad, right? But you say in your world, which is our world here, you say we're not even at 74 over 26, we're at 98 over 2. For every woman, there are 49 men, which is ridiculously extreme. And then you go yeah, on absolutely. to kind of try to figure out why is it so extreme in this particular subculture of the tech industry. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's it's interesting because uh, when when you talk about these differences between the open source uh, startup world and programming in general, you're looking at, as you said, a huge gap. Meaning, if women are 26 percent of developers in general, and they're two percent of developers in open source and startup. Uh, you know, the, there's one question, which is why are we only at 26% overall? There's a lot right. of people that are thinking about that uh, problem. But the one that I'm more interested in is why are we only at 2%? Why don't we track the overall industry? Because uh, you would think, right? You would think that if if the overall industry was 26%, that we would be, you know, sort of within margin of error of 26%, but we're not. And so one of the things that I thought about that was that there are we have a very interesting culture in the startup and open source world that is not present in the big company world. And that is that we, we love people who are self-taught. Um, all of our heroes are people that are, were college dropouts, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the DHHs, for example, right? These are people that do, don't have computer science degrees, but have made incredible impacts on the world of programming. And uh, you can see that also in the way that we have shifted our hiring practices to be more, to take more into account things like your GitHub profile, like how much uh, open source do you do? What kind of things do you contribute to? Can I look at your code, right? So um, we depend much more on these informal qualifications than, do the, than does the rest of the industry. So if you walk into a, a Google interview or a Microsoft interview or, or something like that, uh, they're going to expect you to have a computer science degree and they're going to expect you to have all of the knowledge that a computer science degree brings. And that is not necessarily true where we are. And in, so in uh, sort of in compensation for that, because we 
we like to think about ourselves as being sort of the self-taught bootstrap type people. Uh, we fill in the gap with other things like GitHub profile and conference talks and blog posts and that kind of thing. And those are the things that are more subject to the bias that I spoke about earlier. And so what that means is that as a community, we are more reliant on evaluation methods that are subject to that bias. And uh, people with formal educational degree, people who have computer science degrees, who, for, you know, for example, have worked at Google or have worked at Microsoft, you know, those folks have uh, formal qualifications that can sometimes compensate for, uh, for the gap. But if they're self-taught, which is what we see all of these people coming into the community from the code schools, uh, most of them are self-taught and don't have computer science degrees, those people are going to find it much harder because they're going to find that the evaluation criteria that people use is much more subject to this gender and racial bias that we all have. Yeah, I think, you know, it is definitely gender and racial bias. I think it also kind of leads itself into, uh, you know, you could call it age discrimination or even lifestyle bias because the ones who may not have the strong open source uh, contributions or the, you know, the excellent list of conferences that they've spoke at or keynoted, it's because they're doing other things with their free time, right? I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And with women, you know, traditionally it's at home with kids or, you know, the housework, the things that you bring up in the article, um, you know, the same can apply uh, probably less so in the West to, to men with kids. Um, mm -hmm. So what do you think about this whole GitHub as resume as a thing? Is that, is that just a bad idea that we all kind of, stumbled into or, or or are we just kind of doing it wrong? I think that it's a it's an interesting it's definitely an interesting idea. Um, one of one of the things that I think though is interesting about that, I actually did a talk about this last year at Nickel City Ruby, is that if you look at my GitHub profile, I basically don't contribute to open source. So you look at my contribution graph, it's basically completely blank. There's a few little green squares here and there where I did some bridge stuff usually. Yeah, I was, I right? was judging you. Yeah. See you look at that and you're like, huh. Well, uh, hmm. Sarah, geez, what's going on here? Well, and the interesting thing was when I was at Nickel City place. Ruby, I looked at all of the other speakers' contribution graphs, and they were all extremely impressive, lots of green squares. It was great. So you look at that, and you're like, well, I mean, if you're looking at GitHub as your resume, and you look at my GitHub, uh, you're probably not going to get a really good sense of what I can no. do, right? And, you know, I think I'm an extreme example because I have surfaced in other ways within the community. But for people who haven't done that, the question is, like, how how much are we losing by depending on uh, public publishing of code? Like, how many people are we missing out on? Because mm, right. that's one of, you know, that's the thing that we depend on the most. I think it's definitely something that can be taken into consideration, just like everything else. Uh, however, I don't think that it's it's great as a filtering mechanism. I think some of it plays into the whole passion conversation, which is something that the startup and open source community have in common. Have in common is that we value the desire, the passion as something that's that is a characteristic that we like. And so we look at lack of contribution or lack of public code or what have you as you don't have a passion for this craft. Which could, which is sometimes the case, and sometimes it's a complete red herring, right? Right, exactly. I don't think those are necessarily comparable statements. I agree with you. That's what we're looking for is the passion, yeah. um, but I think that the mechanism that we've chosen for that is insufficient. I agree. We uh, we started out talking about the industry overall. Could could maybe you better define what the industry overall is when you say that versus because it feels kind of like a a slightly us versus them, or at least for when it comes to stats of 26% of developers and only nine, you know, two out of 98 are women, who is the, what makes up the industry overall when you say that? The industry overall includes, uh, in addition to sort of the startup and open source worlds that we, that we're in, it includes both sort of the larger, what I would consider to be the larger open source companies, things like Google, um, and also larger, more traditional organizations, your IBMs, your HPs, and also, even more than that, it is the non-technology-focused organizations that employ programmers. So, for example, banks, insurance companies support uh, 
provide millions and millions of programmer jobs, uh, most of which uh, are not the, I, most of which we don't see living in our GitHub world. Well, we got to take a quick break here uh, to listen to a word from one of our sponsors. We'll come back in just a second. TopTal is the best place to work as a freelance software developer. If you're freelancing right now as a software developer and you're looking for a way to work with top clients on projects that are interesting, challenging, and using the technologies you want to use, TopTal might just be the place for you. Working as a freelance software developer with TopTal means that your days of searching for long-term, high-quality work and getting paid what you're worth will be over. Let's face it, you're an awesome developer and you deserve to be compensated like one. Joining TopTal means you'll have the opportunity to travel the world as an elite engineer. On top of that, TopTal can help provide the software, hardware, and support you need to work effectively no matter where you are in the world. Head to toptal.com slash developers. That's T-O-P-T-A-L dot com slash developers to learn more and tell them the change law sent you. All right, Sarah, we're back. Um, I think some of the things we've been talking about around this perceived competence is, is what you describe as the credibility gap. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. The, the credibility gap is, is a phenomenon where if you have two people that are, have more or less equivalent skills and the difference between them is gender, then people will make assumptions about comp- the competence of the person. If you're trying to judge the competence of the person in front of you and you know what the gender of the people are, you will, usually assign a higher competence to a male uh, programmer in front of you than to a female programmer in front of you. And you can see this come out in a lot of different ways. So for example, if you go to a meetup and you see a woman in a meetup, it used to be that uh, you could pretty much assume that she was a recruiter and not necessarily a programmer. Uh, But that making that assumption can be dangerous because if she is a programmer, then she is starting from this deficit of competence that you have sort of projected onto her. And even if even if you get corrected, even if you talk to her and discover she's not a recruiter, she is a programmer. In fact, she's a better programmer than you are. Like, that's great. But it doesn't uh, make up for the initial uh, gap that you perceive and that you assign essentially to her. And uh, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a psychological phenomenon. I, th- I, I think of it as a, as a bug in our wetware, meaning like it's, it's something that our brain does that we don't want it to do necessarily. And so at this point, what we need to do is understand that it does it and work with it. In golf, they call that uh, that credibility gap a handicap. No that word. Yeah. Because, huh. uh, right, so if you're a golfer, right, if I don't play golf off enough, but I know enough of the terms, but they call the, you know, the idea of the game shooting. So if you shoot, I don't even know what the number is, Jared. When was the last time you played golf? Ah. Never. No, it's nine, yeah, it's nine. It's par 72, man. I mean, I, right. There you go. Par 72. Okay. So just to give me some baseline to run some numbers off here, there's like, you know, par, don't worry about the golf terms. I messed that up. But nonetheless, <laughs> you know, nonetheless, they do call it you a know, the point is, is that if I come into the game and I'm not as good as a pro or somebody who's better than me, I come in with some shots ahead and they call that a handicap, which is somewhat similar to what you're talking about, which is, actually a perceived gap which is me or someone else placing uh, a deficit of of uh, ability on someone based on their gender race or creed exactly yeah, yeah. yeah and a it's, handicap is yeah. trying to actually level the playing field yeah um in the case of the credibility gap is that we, we start off with a unlevel playing field some consciously in our mind i believe is what she's saying and so maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves because some of, some of the solutions to the to the problem that sarah suggests is to kind of give that benefit of the doubt, almost to give a woman that you don't know a handicap until you have more information to act on because she's she's operating at such a deficit already that it's unfair. Yeah. But you also said too, Sarah, that you first noticed yourself make the same kind of mistake a few years ago at a conference. Can you talk a little bit about that situation and how you felt when you did that? Yeah, I was, uh, I was at a, I think I was at a meetup in San Francisco and uh, I was in line at the bar, and there was a woman in front of me. And so I started talking to her. Uh, and I was before I did that, I had this this you know I do what everyone does, which is that I looked at her and I was like, hmm, well, she's dressed pretty nice. Probably she's not wearing t-shirt and jeans. Like, hmm, she's probably a recruiter. 
or, you know, maybe she's a product manager or something. And it wasn't necessarily a conscious judgment, but I looked at her and I made a decision about what I thought she wanted to talk about, for example. And so uh, I started to talk to her and I realized about three or four sentences in that she was a developer. In fact, she was a developer with way more experience than I had. And I had just mistaken her for essentially a a non-programmer based purely on what she looked like. So did you put your foot in your mouth or? Yeah, did you know, I yeah, totally you did. Did, <laughs> <laughs> did you I have mean, to apologize or did you? No, it's one of those things where internal? it's like, it's more like, it was more of an internal thing. I think I'm mm-hmm. sure she noticed because I noticed when people do it to me, but uh, most of the time I don't mention it. Um, and she didn't mention it, which I was very grateful for. Uh, but you know, what that shows is that, that even people who are in that group make that mistake, right? I make that mistake. All women make that mistake. Um, you know, and when you see this come through also in race, you'll know you'll you'll see that uh, white people make this mistake in assuming that other white people are more competent. But black people also do it. They also will rate people who are white higher. And so it's just part of the the cultural milieu that we're living in. And it's unescapable for all of us that are that are here. Yeah, I know that. Uh... You know, just on the fact that we all discriminate that way, I think it's as you said in your in your post here. It's sort of like cultural. It's sort of subconscious that you sort of get pulled into this, and you may not even do it intentionally. Even if you can bleed to the nth degree that you're not racist or biased or whatever the terms you might apply to a negative connotation on that, is that we tend to just do that. I think it's part of societal upbringings to a degree, and we see it in media, we see it in marketing, we see it. Almost everywhere we go, people being objectified, not just women, but also men, also different religions as a race and creed. And it's sort of this systemic issue that we have. And But, but you're zooming specifically into the, you know, as you mentioned in the pre-call, this subreddit, the subculture of where we kind of hang out, which is like in the in the open source community, the developer community, where I guess the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, that, that we, none of this we do is really – intentional but we do do it day to day we do and sometimes these assumptions are correct right and so that's Mm -hmm. that's when it's even hardest to see it like when i see a woman at a meetup and i assume she's a recruiter and i'm right then i don't notice it right i don't notice that i made that judgment and so one of the things that i've been thinking a lot about is how can i how can i practice uh, not making that mistake and so what i've been trying to do is When I meet a woman at a conference or at a meetup, uh, I assume she's incredibly technical and I will start talking to her as though she is. And then sometimes I'm wrong. But I what that does, uh, at least what I'm hope that it does, is that it it uh, levels the playing field a little bit so that if she is technical, that we can talk about, you know, we can she doesn't start with the same perception gap that she would otherwise. And hopefully over time, what that'll do is it'll recalibrate, hopefully, uh, you know, at least a little bit, recalibrate the way that I evaluate people at a subconscious level. But I think that that's a, that's a long-term goal. How does some of this play into the passions that come back to Sarah, the Sarah that goes to RailsBridge, the Sarah that co-founded RailsBridge that, you know, does all this stuff. How does that, you know, this play into, you know, this topic play back into how you treat your work there and how you form community and bonds there inside of RailsBridge? Um, It's interesting because RailsBridge has exposed me to many more female developers than I ever knew before. And so I have seen an incredible variety of people come through RailsBridge. We actually have quite a few people come through RailsBridge who are developers from other communities that just want to learn Rails, uh, in addition to people that are new to programming. And so I've met all kinds of, of female developers of various types, system administrators, um, uh, DBAs, PHP devs, .NET people, Java people, and so on. And it's expanded my idea of, I, and that has helped me expand my idea of what a female developer looks like, because I've seen so many more examples. I think part of the problem that we have is that we don't have that many examples. Because we're at 2% and because we don't tend to go to conferences where people from insurance companies hang out, we don't see those people. And part of the goal of RailsBridge was always to to integrate 
not to have our own little island of women doing their own thing, but to integrate back into the larger community. As I said, my original goal was to not be the only woman at any given SF Ruby meetup. And so to that end, we've always brought in uh, men from the community to to teach, to TA, to volunteer. And we have our workshop structure is set up fairly deliberately so that uh, there are social opportunities to, and not just sort of uh, from on the teacher student level to get to know people in the community. And so an interesting side effect of that is that uh, around San Francisco, at least, and I've heard this from other communities that have strong rails bridge contingents, uh, the men in the community have gotten better at teaching, which is an interesting side effect. Uh, and they've also been able to see more varieties of female developers than they can see just at their job or, or at the you know at the meetups where it used to be you know two to three percent. So I think that uh, part of where this comes from for me is that I feel like we need to, as a community, we need to see the variety of of developers along many different axes of diversity in order to start normalizing their presence in our community at all. Well, in your blog post, you did have some prescriptions for us. So maybe it's a good point here to sort of talk about some of those prescriptions in terms of what we can do to to sort of do this. And the first thing you mentioned was, I guess, is the summary of your, your blog post, which we didn't really talk about the intro, which I loved a lot too, which was your trip in London talking about this idea of the gap when you're walking off the tram. But, uh, you know, first in your list of things to do that you can uh, do to fight back is is to notice the gap, recognize and acknowledge that these assumptions are in place when you make them, you know, sort of like you did at that conference or sort of like I might do when I'm at a, a meetup and I might make an assumption about someone that they, they are not a developer or just in general is to just notice this gap, period. Yeah, I think that's the first step. And and for me, uh, it took a while before I knew what to do about it. So I, I sort of I, I just for a long time, I just sort of kept an eye on it. Like I would notice when it happened. I started to try and pay attention to it. Uh, so to, to, you know, so that when I met women, other women, uh, at meetups and at conferences and so on, I would just sort of keep track of like, Oh, I made an assumption about that one. I didn't make an assumption about that one. That's interesting. And I think just noticing it is, is the first step because none of us, you know, I don't think that I am sexist. I don't think that I'm racist. Uh, however, my actions when I'm looking at resumes and when I'm meeting people at meetups is different depending on those factors. And I think that it's important for us to understand the cognitive skew that we are subject to, because that's the only, just just being able to see it is the first step to being able to do something about it. I agree with you. Absolutely. I think some of the best things that we can do to help one another with regards to these subconscious uh, prejudices that we have is first of all, just to raise awareness that this is a possibility, that this is something that you do. Um, and then secondly is to put a name on it, um, which at least for me, you've done for me, credibility gap is not something that previously had a name in my mind. Um, but as I was reading your post, I can definitely like go back in recent history and be like, yep, that's, I did that there. I did that there, you know, as I, I could uh, commiserate with, with your experience that you recorded there. And uh, I think it's incredibly valuable, first of all, that we just have these conversations. And secondly, that we can actually put a name to something that – to a bias that we have. Um, just like in software, when you can put a name on something, it becomes more concrete. It, it's a lot easier to check yourself if you have like some sort of hook by which to do it. And I think just having that term credibility gap kind of empowers us to judge our own thoughts you know, before we project those onto other people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's pause here for an ad and we'll be right back. It is time to put the programming books away. Put them away, put them down, and learn by doing with Code School. Code School offers a variety of courses to help you expand your skills and learn new technologies such as JavaScript, Ruby, iOS, Git, HTML, CSS, and many more. Code School knows that learning to code can be a daunting task. They combine experienced instructors with proven learning techniques to make learning to code educational as well as memorable, giving you the confidence you need to continue past the hurdles. They're always launching new courses, 
on new technologies and offering deep dives on tried and true languages. So if you don't see them, you need suggest a course and they'll build it if there's enough demand. Those school also knows that languages are a moving target. They're always updating content to give you the latest and greatest learning resources. You can even try before you buy. Roughly one out of every five courses on Code School is free. This includes introductory classes for Git, Ruby, and jQuery, which allow free members to play full courses with coding challenges included. You can also pay as you go. One monthly fee gives you full access to every Code School course. And if you ever need a breather, take a break, you can suspend your account at any time. Don't worry, your account history, points, and badges will all be there when you're ready to pick things up again. Get started on sharpening your skills today at CodeSchool.com. Once again, that's CodeSchool.com. All right, well, we're back. Um, <laughs> it's a little weird because we're not doing those pauses, so just if you're listening and they and they sound a little abnormal, this is the first time we're doing them. So we around here, we like to experiment, and we uh, we do things abnormally sometimes. So the second thing that uh, you talked about, Sarah, in terms of what we can do is to step across the gap. And what do you what do you mean by that? You, you say make a conscious effort to to combat those assumptions, but I think we kind of touched a little bit there uh, pre to the the sponsorship there. But what is some ways that um, that we can step across that gap and, and begin to break down those barriers? Yeah, well, one of one of the ones was uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is that uh, when you when when I meet uh, a woman or a non white person at a conference, I make a conscious decision in my head to assume that they are technical until I am absolutely proven otherwise. And my hope with that is that uh, I am making up for a little bit of that gap, uh, the credibility gap that has embedded itself in my brain. Uh, Another thing that I do that I've found that's been really effective is that when I'm hiring, uh, before I look at anyone's resume, Mm. I have somebody take out all of the indications of gender. And that's not just the name. It can be things like You know, if they went to a a women's college or a traditionally black university, like they need to take that kind of stuff out, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things uh, beyond the name that that need to be adjusted. And you'll find out what those are over time when you start doing it. Uh, But the nice thing about that is that it allows me to look at a resume without without making assumptions about the gender. Then if I for the people that sort of make it through the first screening, then I actually ask my HR person to print out some of their code from GitHub and show it to me without, basically I want to see it without their name attached Mm. because this bias will also affect us when we're looking at code, when we're judging someone, when we're doing code review, uh, when we're evaluating conference proposals and so on. And so uh, any way that I can remove that bias from the preamble, I mean, certainly once you're like, talking to somebody, it's pretty difficult to ignore. Uh, but the steps leading up to that actually seem to be where a lot of the women drop out of our process. And what I found was that once I started doing that, we got a lot, we got a much more diverse set of folks in the door for interviews. And uh, this is part of the, you know, the, the problem that we have where a lot of companies will tell me, well, you know, I don't know what to do because no women applied for my job. No women submitted a talk to my conference. There's a problem there uh, in terms of getting people to, you know, in terms of reaching out to people and asking them to apply and asking them to submit. But even once you do, if you are then evaluating what they send in, knowing their name or their other demographic information, what you find is that fewer women get through that phase. So I think that uh, it's absolutely critical that we remove that information from uh, whoever it is that's making that decision about who moves on to the next section of the interview. You find that causes a lot of management overhead. I know you mentioned a little bit, but is it a real pain to to get those uh, names scrubbed before you view, uh, do the code review? Uh, it can be. I think that, um, you know, sometimes it will, sometimes it's difficult to evaluate. You know, there, There's sometimes when it's, it requires so much information to be taken out that it's then difficult to evaluate. Right. Yeah. I try to do that case by case. Right. And, uh, you know, part of how people could help me with that is if they could, I'm not quite sure how to make the suggestion, but if they could write, um, <laughs> some software, that'll do but, it. no, well, I mean, when they send in a resume, 
try to make sure that there's nothing in the body of the resume that would give away gender or race, for example, right? So, for example, sometimes occasionally people will refer to themselves as a third person, right? So, mm. you know, if you're talking about something uh, the book, like he did blah, blah, blah at this company, right? Mm. Uh, that kind of stuff, you know, which, you know, resume style guides tell you not to do anyway, but we, we see a reasonable amount of that. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. But uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's definitely been overall positive because it does mean that we get a lot more women in for like the in-person interviews. Um, and, you know, there's another set of problems once you're in the in-person interviews, but, <laughs> but at uh, least. You talked uh, about that a bit, didn't you? Was that another, uh, you might have been another post I read that just, just the, um, the, the boardroom kind of look, you know, you come into a, you know, you mentioned Google earlier in the call, but the in-person interview can be just as hard as just getting in the door or, you know, getting your proposal looked at, then getting a face to face with someone could be just as hard as actually getting there in general. Yeah, and that's true. But I think that there are we have to combat this bias in different ways at each stage of these processes. And uh, so, you know, step zero really is getting uh, resumes in the door. And then step one is making sure that you can evaluate those resumes in a way that is less subject to bias than it would be if you just looked at them the way they came in. I think it's a smart idea too, to, to sort of protect yourself. You know, this is, this is more like, um, I guess that's maybe a bad way to put it, but it's protect yourself from yourself for the betterment of the community, because, you know, there you go with, when you say make a conscious effort to step across the gap, you know that you have some sort of uh, subconscious prejudice whether you like it or not, that happens, whether you like it or not, it's just some sort of innate subcultural thing that uh, we sort of judge people based on some attributes to remove those abilities to judge. And then you kind of get a, an even playing field and even an even look at a person's proposal for a conference or a job application or what have you, you sort of protect yourself from that, that uh, evaluating them in a bad way. Yeah. You, know, you give them a chance before they're where they may not have been a chance. Moves us closer to what we all as programmers want is like a meritocracy, right? Yeah. Where it's just purely based on merit. And we can't do that without some barriers to biases because they're so yeah. ingrained in us. So I think on the on the coding side, it seemed like a pretty decent chance of writing some open source software where you could, you know, point to a specific thing on the web and maybe it'd go and scrub it of any names and uh, you know, for certain adverbs and or not adverbs uh, pronouns and whatnot um on the resume side yeah definitely harder as they come in all so many forms but um we definitely seen some some conferences doing that as well i think maybe you mentioned that you also do that for your conference talks seems like a great uh way of of leveling the playing field for picking conference uh speakers as well yeah we've actually had pretty amazing success with that um, at Ruby Confident Rails Conf, we use a piece of software that we developed ourselves, actually, um, but which is open source, which anyone can use. And it has a it follows a process where there are reviewers, and reviewers will go in and uh, assign a rating to a talk, but they don't see any of the demographic information. So they don't see the name, they don't see the bio, and we ask people in the call for proposal text to please not put any identifying information in their proposal itself. Mm -hmm. um, and some people, you know, some people still do, but uh, usually how that works is we just kind of ask them to take it out <laughs> before we start evaluating it. And then once we have a first round of scores, uh, at that point, a smaller group of people goes in and looks at, looks at the talks, uh, including the biographical information and including the name. And then, uh, evaluates them based on, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into making a balanced program, certainly for a big conference like RailsConf, uh, or I should, I should say, big for the Ruby world, although it's fairly small overall. But for something like that, there's definitely a set of topics that we want to make sure we cover. Um, and so at that point, we're taking a lot of different things into consideration, including the experience of the speaker and things like that. So, uh, But it allows us to get a first round, at least, that is uh, less subject to the biases that we all mm -hmm. carry. That's a good starting point. What's the name of that software, if you recall? I think it's called CFP App. Nice uh, <laughs> creative name. 
Uh, there's it. a link to it in my blog post. I found think. it. Ruby Central slash CFP dash app. We'll link that up in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. I also liked what you said too that uh, Sarah, when when going through this process, that some known good speakers may not actually get through because of a crappy. I think you actually said shitty, but crappy proposal. <laughs> um, you know, so you know, it's it sort of strikes a balance there where you know, get your proposal in order, even if you're a known credible speaker, get your proposal on par. And and you might make it through it, and you actually take it based on not so much who they are and what they've done, but what the actual proposal is proposing for the conference. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. I feel like this process has actually improved overall the quality of the proposals that we get, not just the number of them or the, the diversity of them, but actually I think everyone's proposals have improved um, because I think they have to, right? If you're yeah. if you want to make it through the first round, and you know we do consider who the speaker is uh, at some point during the process. So that's not something that we don't consider at all, but I think that it's some conferences in the Ruby space, I feel like have become uh, a collection of people that I have seen before, right? And it's sort of the same set of people that you see at every conference. And I am one of those people at this point because I've done so many conference talks. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing fewer of them is because I feel like it's, someone else's turn essentially <laughs> but i think that uh one of the things that this process can help with is in is is help us to discover people who are going to be amazing speakers uh, and find them even if they haven't done a talk before or even if they've only done a talk at their local meetup or something along those lines and uh get them uh, you know get them onto the circuit get them into into our collective consciousness well, I know that we could probably go uh, quite a bit further when talking through this. I know that uh, this is certainly on our hearts when we when we think about you know prejudice and biases uh, to our peers, and it's something that I certainly want to be mindful of. But at the same time, your last point, which is not to stare too deeply for too long into this gap because you might go a little crazy. I, you didn't say that as my words. I said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that it's it's something that you need to think about, but it doesn't mean that it needs to consume everything that you think about it. And you need to give yourself permission to still screw it up uh, because it's going to happen. You're going to make this. We're human, you know, I mean, we're going to, exactly. We're just, we're just broken people. It's going to, it's going to happen sometime. Yeah. And my, the way that I try and deal with that is just to, when I notice myself doing it, just be like, wow, I just did that thing. And I'm sorry about that. Let's move on. So I do apologize these days when I notice myself doing it, because I think that it's important for me to acknowledge to other people that I am, you know, that I made that mistake and I'm sorry, but then I move on. And I think my hope is that over time it'll make at least a little bit of a difference uh, in how I perceive people. I think it goes back to your second prescriptive, which is make a conscious effort to step across. I think part of stepping across is admitting that there's something to step across of. And like you said, apologize when it might happen that way, you know, whomever you may have offended, whether it's face to face or digitally somehow via email or something passive, it gives you a chance to, you know, apologize right then and there and, you know, kind of bring it back to even uh, to a degree and, and hopefully have made a friend versus an enemy. Yeah. And I worry less about uh, offending people. I worry more about alienating them. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. I think that uh, we've got these people coming into the community now and we are, you know, it, it would be very easy for them to have a couple of bad experiences and say, you know, screw this, I'm going to go back to being a an economics professor or whatever it is. And uh, I think that that's, that's the thing that I worry about. I worry about alienating these people that we really, really want here. Absolutely. I think uh, related to that, when we talk about the business case, because sometimes we have to appeal to the, to our, to our basest desires, which is, you know, to make more money. And I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, there's of course the social and the uh, moral reasons of, fighting towards this, these equalities. But there's also a strong business case for diversity inside your company, uh, which you link to in your article. Do you want to touch on that real quick? Yeah, it's interesting. There's been a bunch of interesting scientific research around the fact that if what you are doing uh, could be considered creative, which means that there's more than one way to solve a problem, which you know sounds a lot like programming to me, then uh, often your creative problem-solving process will benefit from a team that is diverse. And they may not even look on paper as qualified as a team that is less diverse, but they will routinely do better. 
And I think that that's fascinating. There's also been some interesting research around uh, things like startups that have women on the board are routinely more successful and things along those lines. So there's a growing body of research that says that anytime you're doing something creative, which includes, in my opinion, programming and creating products, a more diverse team is actually going to get you a better outcome. Absolutely. You also mentioned, Sarah, um, I can't remember, it was it uh, in the pre-call or was it in the early call? You mentioned your article, Pairing with Junior Developers. I also wanted to talk quickly about this because it sort of bleeds into uh, what you do at DevMind and what you do at, at uh, RailsBridge. How does all this play out, I guess, in what it means to pair with junior developers? And that was a huge article for you and even DevMind, 29,234 views. So congrats on that. Yeah, in two months, which is more than I was expecting for sure. It's interesting because uh, the Ruby community is in an interesting place right now because we do have, um, we are the vanguard for all of these new folks coming in from these code schools. And so we are figuring out a bunch of stuff such as uh, how do you work with someone that's junior? What cultural changes do you need to make within your team in order to be able to uh, welcome a junior person into the team? And what code base changes do you need to make in order to be able to welcome a junior person into your team? And so that, that, Post was basically my first set of steps of like, here's what here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to think about it when you're working with someone who's junior. And we've had a bunch of different apprentices uh, at DevMind. In fact, we're hiring more apprentices right now. And the interesting thing about it is that it really has changed both how we uh, organize our teams and how we actually write software. Um, and but maybe that's a subject for another post. <laughs> What uh, you mentioned some job opportunities at DevMind. Where can someone go? Is it slash jobs? DevMind.com slash jobs? That might be it, yes. D E V M Y N D dot com slash jobs. That's since right. I'm asking you a rhetorical question, since I knew the answer. Yes, that sounds <laughs> um, great. But we're on a podcast, so it was not record- rhetorical. <laughs> um, yeah, DevMind, D E V M Y N D dot com slash jobs. Um, you got a couple there, and you also mentioned your apprenticeship as well in the same area. So if you're interested, take a peek at that. Um, maybe now, Jared, it's a good time to, to tail into some of our super awesome ending common questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's start with uh, the old saw. Sarah, please tell us, who is your programming hero? Who is my programming hero? You can't pick just one. We, I know, there's we, so we'll many, We'll let you right? pick a couple. So I've always been inspired by... Grace Hopper, who I'm sure you're familiar with, who mainly because she became a programmer at the age of 39. Wow. She did all of her best work in her 40s. And uh, as someone who is heading into that direction uh, at this point in my life, we have a a mythos in our our culture that all of the best work is done by young people, Mm -hmm. that everyone's best work is done by the time they're 25. So one of the things that I love about her story is that that shows it's really not true. All of the amazing work she did with uh, the compilers and so on was all done in her 40s. And that gives me hope, I guess, as someone who's who's getting there, um, that uh, that maybe my best work isn't behind me. Yeah, I, I don't subscribe to that, that uh, rule of thought either. I'm, uh, you know, I'm post-25. I'm actually next month, this month. Jeez, in a few days, as a matter of fact. Next week is my birthday. Oh, happy on birthday, the same, bro. On the same day. <laughs> I happy turned 36. 36. Wow. Uh, yeah, over the hill, dude. That's the thing. Oh, man. <sighs> I Your do best work so is behind though. you. Oh, man. My best work. My best work. <laughs> I was I was a terrible, <laughs> terrible programmer when I was 25. So I was, too. And so that's the amazing <laughs> thing. I mean, I, you know. Yeah, I, have, I don't know. I have high hopes for Thank future. God for amazing Grace Hopper to uh, show yeah. us the way. <laughs> awesome. Well, another uh, clo- cl- closing question that we ask, uh, we have to adjust it a little bit. Usually we ask, what's a call to arms uh, or something you would say to the open source community with regard to some project that you're working on? But in the case of mining the gap, I guess uh, here's an opportunity for you, Sarah, to uh, have a call to arms to those listening out there, uh, how they can uh, help you and us in this effort. What would you say? I would say the first thing that you can do is to volunteer at a Rails Bridge workshop or a Rails Girls workshop or or any of these other things, or even at one of the code schools that's uh, that's um, working with diverse students. Start uh, start to meet people that are programmers that are not 
who are you're used to looking at. Just meeting them and even just for a day, even just going in and, and doing doing Rails Bridge for a day is actually an incredibly eye-opening experience. It was for me anyway. And, and I've people continue to tell me that that is one of their favorite things about it is that they they meet people that are so different from the folks that they encounter at, at, uh, every day in their work. You know, that brings to mind, how can someone take part in a Rails bridge? So what you, you mentioned, you got mobile bridge now, you got closure bridge. Um, what's the easiest way to find out what's happening in that, in those, in that community at large. And then those micro communities as it relates to a certain language or a certain camp. That's an interesting question. We've actually been thinking about that quite a bit ourselves Right now, the best way is to look at Bridge Troll, um, which I think it's bridgetroll.org, although uh, don't quote me on that. But that's where we have all of the um, workshops that are coming up in all of the different bridges. And uh, we've been thinking about how we can evangelize both the individual communities, but also you know, get other communities interested in doing this type of thing. Um, and we've got some ideas in that in that direction, but we haven't quite put anything into action yet. But so for now, Bridge Troll is the best way to find out what's happening. In yeah, your just to area. confirm for everyone, it is bridgetroll.org. So just like you would spell bridge, and just like you would spell troll, bridgetroll.org. Uh, I like that. I like the the the, the troll too. He's he's, he's sh- very Shrek like. <laughs> very Shrek-like. Yeah, he's a friendly troll. He is. You know, he doesn't bite. Exactly. Um, let's see the next one, um, we should ask, I'm looking through it. I I guess this one fits no matter what, no matter who you are. What's, what's on your open source radar? Like if you had a weekend to hack on something, what would it be? Would it be a new language? Would it be a new framework? Would it be curriculum? You know, what would it be for you? So one of the things I've been realizing recently is that I, I look at a lot of Rails apps, being a consultant and being someone that goes in and tends to, you know, sort of uh, go into projects that are already already going, already a going concern. I see a lot of different code bases, but they tend to all be Rails apps. And one of the most interesting things happened to me last week. I was uh, on vacation <laughs> and uh, I paired on fixing an RSpec bug with uh, Sam Pippen, who's a member of the RSpec core team. And looking at the RSpec, the interior of the RSpec code base was amazing because all of my assumptions that I carry with me from Rails apps about what makes good code are all wrong. It was mm. really amazing. And so I think at this point, what I would do is I, I would want to look at more, look at RSpecs more, look at other gems and in the interior of them and just try and figure out like, what are the different assumptions that they have that lead to such structurally different code? Well, if you do that, you should write about it. <laughs> so, I can, <laughs> so I can read about your findings. That'd be spectacular. I've done a conference talk about that before, actually, but maybe you I should have. write it down. Did that yeah. get on? Did that get on video? Is it online somewhere? Let's. I think that was. That's the one that I did at Nickel City, actually. Uh, so I think it is on Confreaks. Cool. You know, something that you just mentioned there too, Jared, reminded me of a whole different post, but something in the same vein. And maybe we can spend a minute on this, or if you've got an opinion, was that um, even conference talks from those who are often judged or biased against or towards, I'm not really sure the best way to to sort of say that, but are apprehensive about uh, giving a talk because it often ends up on video. So mm-hmm. there's some sort of like, you know, always this artifact where you just want to sort of meet in person. Um, and I even saw um, Jan Leonard uh, the other day talked about, I can't recall which conference, but it was super neat, was how they had colored bands. You might know this um, for, yes, you could take pictures of me. Uh, maybe if you can, a- if you ask me, you can take a picture of me or no, not at all. Um, and they had different colored lanyards based on, you know, how you felt about showing who you are or just, I guess, showing your face mm-hmm. or, you know, in public, but having this artifact that sort of lives beyond, uh, beyond conferences. What do you feel about the, the thought of someone possibly not, uh, giving a proposal because they don't want to be on camera? That is a, a really interesting thing. I, you know, for, for some people, there's there's definitely some safety issues involved, right? You know, for example, someone has, you know, an abusive ex-spouse or something, you know, things like that, uh, where they just don't want to end up even in, you know, even in uh, sort of incidental photos of the conference. Um, and beyond that, I think that it's good for us to support different ways of being at a conference. 
I think that, you know, it's, it's always the case that we can, uh, if we want to talk, we can always, you know, the, whether or not it's on video is, can always be a point of negotiation. So obviously as a conference organizer, we'd love to have all of the, all of the talks on video so that we can use them to promote next year's conference. However, uh, it's not required. Um, I think that we would be missing out on a bunch of talks if we made it mandatory to have them be filmed. So, you know, as much as I would love to have films of every single talk, um, I don't know if you've looked at the Confreak site recently, but there's like thousands of them already there. (laughs) So uh, I think it's, you know, if you want to do a conference talk, but you don't want it to be recorded, it's certainly something that you can ask the organizer about. Yeah. I think that's the the point there too, is just being able to, you know, sometimes when you're newer to a community, you feel like you have less authority or less ability. And I think part of the part of that is an invitation, a sort of an open invitation to the world. Hey, if you're coming to one of my conferences or a conference I'm involved in, you know, if you can't go to the organizer, come to me directly. And if you have some concerns, and we'll figure it out. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, that, I think that's the the point there. Well, Sarah, it was definitely great having you on the show. I know we had a little bit of rescheduling there, but we, uh, with your travel back from Denver and London and everywhere you've been recently, where have you been at recently? Uh, the last in, three weeks. Let's see. I was in Denver last week and then the week before that, I had a week at home and then I was in Chicago and then I had a week at home there. I was in Melbourne, Australia for RubyConf AU. And you have a daughter too, right? I do. I have two kids actually. I have a daughter and a son. Daughter, does either of them travel with you? I'm actually about to go on my first conference trip with my daughter, who's nine. We're going to nice. go to New York. So very exciting. Uh, good old New York. Yes. Well, it's been, um, it's definitely been fun having you. Thanks to Matt too. One of our members who suggested the conversation to have with you, uh, mining the gap, but definitely enjoy the article in this conversation with you. Um, is there anything we could do like towards rails bridge or, or anything around the things you're doing? Anything you want to mention as we're closing in, in, uh, you know, how to connect with you, Anyways, they can step into to RailsBridge or anything like that whatsoever. Yeah, RailsBridge is a is an open source organization in that we publish all of our stuff on GitHub, and that anyone can pick it up and do a workshop where they are. And so we are trying to expand geographically. So if you are living in a place where you think a RailsBridge workshop would be useful, uh, do get in touch with me. You can find uh, email and so on. On, on uh, I believe if you look at my Twitter account, you'll eventually find my email. And. Uh, uh, definitely get in touch because we are looking at um, doing some geographical expansion in 2015. So when you say all of your stuff is on the GitHub, you mean curriculum, right? The curriculum, all of our uh, notes for running a conference, uh, sorry, a workshop. We actually organize all of the workshops through GitHub issues. So you can actually see nice. workshops being organized. Uh, we do most of our like, things like board meeting notes and so on also through GitHub issues. So. Uh, we actually make fairly heavy use, non-traditional use, you might say, of GitHub in order to have uh, a very open process. Awesome. Well, Sarah, it has been a pleasure. Uh, we'll link up your Twitter and your GitHub on the show notes. So if you're a listener, go to the show notes for the show. It's episode 146. You get links out to Sarah and all the stuff we've talked about today. So if you've got any questions whatsoever, don't worry about trying to jot down the link while you're trying to drive and listen to this podcast. Just Head to the show notes. They're going to be there. Uh, and with that, everybody, let's uh, let's go ahead and call this a show and, and say goodbye. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on, Sarah. Appreciate it.